Hello and welcome to Dadler Soul Sessions. I'm Jim Colson. I am your host for this evening and we have got a cracking evening of entertainment and intrigue and interest coming up for you for Dadler Soulies and the wider community as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little menu of what's coming up on the screen and pretend that I'm on like daytime TV and there's a cat coming up that's grown the world's biggest hairball followed by a very serious interview with a politician, followed by some celebrity stuff about Gemma Collins. But that's not what we've got on this evening's Dadless Soul Sessions. Uh, 8.30, it's just gone 8.30. Uh, you will get Dan, our one true leader, here. He'll give us an update on the latest Dadless Soul developments, things going on this week, things going on in the future you can get involved with. 8.45, the brilliant Alex is here with his conflict management clinic answering your questions uh, about conflict in general. And then from nine o'clock, Susie Kalick of the uh, Pretty Deadly Self-Defense on how we can support women in our, life, uh, our lives with learning self-defense and staying safe and how we can create that kind of safe environment. That's coming up a little bit later on. Uh, so Dan is on the way very soon, first of all. This is something that we're very chuffed with. Uh, this is our mate, Aidan Goatley, who is a stand-up comedian, and uh, Dan will tell you more about the event that he did with us last week. But then he went on BBC Devon after that. And they were talking about mental health and he gave us a nice shout out. Talk to people is the only thing you can yeah. do. Talk to people and never think that you're a burden. Never think that anyone would be better off without you because I trust me, that is never the case. Never the case. Aidan, you'd echo there. Uh, absolutely. I was, um, it, it's so important, as, as you've all said, is that, you know, as difficult as it may seem, that there, there is always someone who will be there to listen. You know, there's someone that you can speak to. And the difficulty, obviously, we're talking about, I know it's a bit of a stereotype, but blokes just don't talk about stuff. And um, there, there are a number of different options. There are different things. And uh, your, your, your listener who was saying, you know, sitting on the beach, you know, talking about joking and laughing, but sometimes, you know, you might surprise yourself that if you do open up, if you, if you, you know, it takes a step to do that. But if you can tell someone, that's that's half the step. You know, that is a, a big, you know, big way of doing it. Finding groups. I'm I'm involved in a. Only last night, um, I'm involved in a in a in a in a dad group here in in Worthing called uh, Dad La Soul, and it's about getting together. It's not about necessarily sitting down and talking about stuff. It's about spending time and then maybe talking about something if you feel comfortable. Um, there's there's all sorts of different things out there, but um, as t you know, we've all been through tough times. And but if if you know that someone's there and and it, it can help, I, I'm having gone through similar things myself. You know, knowing yeah. that someone was there to be able to talk about it helps. So it's time to check in for our monthly appointment with the Doctor of Dadler Soul. He is Dan Flanagan. Hello. It's Doctor Who because my camera won't work. So you don't know. It could be me. It could be somebody else. I'd like to think it's Alistair McGowan doing a brilliant impression of you. I think it'd be young Brad Pitt if anybody was going to do an impression of me because we look very similar. Yeah, that's true. That is true. Uh, on an Alistair McGowan tip, and I can't believe we're digressing within the first 30 seconds of this conversation. <laughs> but when I used to work in radio, right, you used to get these things offered to you. They were 10-minute interviews with celebrities, but the catch was they were promoting something invariably rubbish. Yeah. So genuinely, Karen Brady was promoting Almond Week. And you get 10 minutes and the idea is you do the interview, but you have to mention the product a little bit in it, but you get the rest of the 10 minutes to talk about The Apprentice or whatever. Yeah. So Alistair McGowan was doing one, but it was quite a worthy one. It was like for some kind of environmental concern. But the only reason you get Alistair McGowan on a radio show is to do impressions, right? Yep. Yeah, he didn't want to do any impressions. He was really upset about the idea of doing impressions because after letting him talk about whatever it was he was talking about for five minutes, I said, oh, well, <laughs> I wonder, you know, how David Beckham might think about that or something like that. And he went, oh, you want me to do impressions? Fine. And he did one begrudgingly and that was it. And I tell you what, Alistair, that interview never went out. <laughs> did you blacklist him? Yeah. Absolutely. Although the Almond Week one with Karen Brady did go out because... Oh, she... yeah. Well, it was. at least she wasn't promoting ripping off the NHS or buying super yachts. 
No, exactly. No, that was, uh, you know, that's a benefit. It was it was pre those times. It was not that she would have done that just from a legal perspective. No, of course not. Um, you know, or people associated or or anything. So and it was it was pre pandemic anyway. So, you know, people hadn't realized that uh, revenue. <laughs> pool. Whoever, you know, some people potentially potentially not, in inverted commas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So okay. Dan, we're what, just getting it sued. Yeah, I know. And I think it's your fault. But um, <laughs> so the good thing is we've never actually met. We've worked together for years. We've never actually met in person. The first time we meet in the dock of the old Bailey would be brilliant, wouldn't it? It was all his idea, Your Honour. Yeah, exactly. Dan, what's going on with Dan LaSalle? Loads and loads and loads and loads of, yeah, no, really nice stuff. We, we've been picking up... Um, some really useful contacts and trying some new products out or projects. So we do our wonderful dad's only meetups. So it's the, I think you cued the phrase of biker grove for dads. Um, and last week, just gone, we had the wonderful stand up comedian, Aidan Goatley come and join us. So he did this really lovely private stand up show. And the idea is to provoke conversation. So from this stand-up show, um, he was talking about his tattoos because that was part of the routine. And he said, oh, the reason I started getting a tattoo was because I used to self-harm. And he thought, like, oh. And then he said, I had a breakdown. And it was, it was really poignant, Jim, the fact that this, you know, you could think, oh, there's going to be an awkward silence there. But actually what it did is open up a really wide ranging conversation of some very different stuff. So that's what we're going to continue to do. Aidan's going to be uh, digging in his black book of fabulous uh, stand up comedians. And we're going to have guest shows every month touching on a very different subject. So everything from mental illness, eating disorders, addictions. And I think as you know, you and I, no, humour is a really good way of provoking um, some really difficult conversations, aren't they? Yeah, it's it's one of those easy routes in, isn't it? It's like it opens the gateway for further conversation. And I think sometimes people can dismiss it a little bit as being like a kind of defensive mechanism. But actually, in some ways, it's that way that we come together. You sort of find your common ground with other people and then you move on to the other conversations that you, you have. So it's it's really important. Yeah, I think it was, it was, and it came really naturally. So rather than say, hello, middle-aged men, come over here and talk about your deepest, darkest feelings, which they would have gone, no. We started doing some really light-hearted stuff, and I, I think we're really onto it. So come along to the Dadless Soul Sessions. There's free beer. See if the beautifully handsome people at Unbarred Brewery. You know, we've got a lovely venue with the top folks at Freedom Works. It's a private space. We've got the VR headsets, play pool you know, tell some jokes, open up, and then, you know, every month we're going to have a guest speaker. So this sort of thing, I don't think has ever been done before. So again, we are, we're breaking new ground. So I'm very, very excited about that. Um, I'm also very excited that the lovely people at Comic Relief have decided to give us £10,000, which goes a big way into opening three new venues. So we're going to launch um, Dad's Only Meetups in Brighton, in Hove, and potentially in sunny Bognor, further down the, the coast. So keep your uh, eyes and ears peeled. It's kind of 98% there. We're just tying up the, you know, the contracts and the, the boring bits of admin that come with these sort of wonderful news. Um, I'm very excited that you're getting to talk to a real-life ninja in a minute. Oh yeah, like Susie's on the way, and I, like look at this picture. Look, that is that is Susie throwing someone over. She is officially badass, and she. I think that's. I think the technical term is double our bastard. Yep, exactly. So we'll be learning about how to uh, support the women in your life or the girls in your life with self defense techniques. Susie is an absolute expert. Her CV is just ridiculously full and impressive. It's like actually. It's strange how I met Susie. It was during lockdown. And if you can cast your mind back, the, the first couple of 
weeks of lockdown one, we were all getting used to it and loads of sort of online meetups sprang up. And I was one, I joined one with the guys that created the, this wonderful thing called the Do Lectures, which uh, have a range of really, really in, inspirational speakers. Um, and so it was this online group of people from all over the world. And I did my little sort of introduction and then she dropped me a DM and we started a conversation and we're still in touch. And now it's, you know, especially now that, you know, we're able to continue these conversations. And I think it's, I think it's not only just the, the self-defense and, you know, maybe training your daughter to be, you know, chuck throwing stars and stuff like that. I think it's awareness of what we as men can do. So, you know, the, I know it's very outdated, but you know, the, activities when you're out on a night out and you know you see a lone walk, woman walking home and actually the judgments that you can make not to add to her potential uh, terror or trauma and i think there's a really interesting conversation that we can do as men to be able to change our behavior but also again instilling our our sons not to grow up to be misogynists misogynistic assholes um and then also train our daughters to throw nunchuckers and throwing stars and all the sort of stuff we used to do in secondary school when i was obsessed with everything karate wise oh yeah the the idea of a ninja star back in the day was like it was the the holy grail and people said they'd found them but found them but i couldn't bring it into school uh, i found one in the woods like, we did did we, you yes i have evidence why well, i say evidence first-hand information that in the second year of school, a few of our lads used to have them. We used to have competitions chucking them into the blackboard, <laughs> right? And then there, there would be slashes down the blackboard and the teacher came in and was trying to figure out what the hell had gone on. And it was, it was because people, that they, I think they'd been on a, we were on a school trip to France. <laughs> so everybody came back with bangers, flick knives and throwing stars. Which, what else would you want as a 12 year old boy? Well, also those pens you turn upside down and the woman gets nudie, right? Those were the... None of, we weren't in Blackpool, mate. Going oh, up in Yorkshire must have been a very different experience. <laughs> Come on, that's my experience of the French exchange, surely. It's everyone else. <laughs> oh, that's a story for a, a different time. Um, yeah. And then what we got uh, this Saturday, we've got our annual Dads versus Kids Nerf battle in the woods with the lovely folks at the Outdoors Project. So that's in a place called Goring Gap, which is just outside uh, Worthing. Lovely little spot right next to the beach. And it's really interesting. You know, the first couple of sessions that we did, you get this group of dads that are just on the sidelines and thinking they're just going to watch their kids do an activity. And it's like, no, you're into this. And then you can see the penny drop and they bring out the war paint and stick it over their noses and go full on Rambo. And they're all out of shape and they're diving in the, the bushes and it is i think we do sort of a, a couple of different games uh around being zombie killing so it's dads dressed up as rambo trying to suit zombie children which i'm sure everybody will agree is a very wholesome thing to do should we have a look at what it looks like we've got a video of one of our previous sessions there oh. Oh. <laughs> that is one of my favorite dadless old videos that kid at the end right very smart because it basically was a, a team off so we had the crips one side the bloods the other side and we all ran and it was kind of last man standing win and what he did slowly walked around the side climbed up a tree Wait for everybody else to kill each other. It's like, I win. That's a future prime minister right there, isn't it? That's someone who is going to do well in life. He was a smart, smart bugger. But when he came down, I shot him. <laughs> <laughs> Pay you back, kid. Need to learn a lesson. <laughs> yeah. It is. Um, so, yeah, that's it's kind of it. Oh, the other thing to mention, it's coming up next month and the month after. We're doing a couple of projects with a wonderful organization based over in the states called fathering together mm -hmm. they've created this huge cohort of dad related 
uh, organisations from all over. So they're getting together to do a series of panels and workshops and stuff. So big up, Brian, if you're listening. The work that they're doing over there is fantastic. And he's, it was really nice, you know, the, the, the sort of Zoom calls I've been having with him to understand, you know, what life and you know, parenting looks like in modern day America um to what we have over here and the so i suppose the interest the similarities that we have you know that we still suffer those those levels of guilt and shame that we're not performing but you know america is i know it's a cousin of ours so to speak but it's a very different place mm. you know so i think there's going to be some really interesting conversations and that for you know us we're a small organization based in the the, the south coast to have that sort of international reach, I, I think is absolutely incredible. So I think that's going to create some great legacy work, some really interesting partnerships. Uh, fingers crossed, you know, one day we might be able to go over there and have a little visit and do some knowledge sharing. And the idea, you know, tie up this, this global group, because there will be dad, dad organisations in New Zealand or Africa that we could learn from. But the thing is, nobody ever talks to each other. So projects like this, is, a, I think, is a great way to sort of um, close those gaps. And if there is funding for foreign trips, I am always ready. And I, I travel light and I don't make much noise on the plane. So You would be our Kate Adig. <laughs> <laughs> it's often been said, the Kate Adig of Dad LaSalle. Um, <laughs> well, I'm Kate Adig because I haven't put my screen on because yeah. I am in a war zone. Yeah. And, you know, I can't disclose exactly where I am for political reasons. Right. Not, not technical reasons that my camera is just buggering around. It's, no. it's politically sensitive. OK, well, that's uh, that's understandable. And uh, thank you very much. And Dan, oh, I tell you what, if you want to come to the uh, Dads and Kids Play Day in Worthing this weekend, you can now get your tickets by going to that QR code, which oh. is right now, you can do that. Almost forgot to do that, the little toy that I've been playing with. I've got another little toy as well, Dan. You ready? Oh. Thank you very much, Dan Flanagan. And... <laughs> There's a round of applause for you. One day, Jim, when you get five minutes, watch this clip back, because you will see pride in your face <laughs> like a six-year-old boy that's just been able to ride his bike without falling off mate you are so happy with that i'm so proud of you i'm i'm, I'm chuffed i'm chuffed dad, have you got a joke by the way what's your favorite dad joke my favorite dad joke oh yes. Put you okay the... um somebody told me you sound like an owl who? Hey! <laughs> there you go. There's another sound effect. That's why I wanted you to do a joke. <laughs> no pressure there. Favourite ever dad joke. Yeah. Let me just get out my comedy Bible that I carry with me continuously. No pressure there, James. I think, you know, I d one day I will prepare you for these things that I throw at you, but I just wanted to show off the, the sound effect. I spent a fortune on it. Genuinely spent a fortune on it. <laughs> I think you want to go old school Kenny Everett and just have some honkers in the back and stuff like that. Yes, that's it. That's what I'll do, definitely. Or more Steve Ryan. That is next month. It's going full zoo format and <laughs> people are going to love it. Uh, if you want to come on Saturday down there, that's how you get your tickets for the Worthing play date. Get the, there. That's the QR code just down there. And coming up very soon, we've got Alex with his conflict management clinic. Dan, thank you very much. Pleasure as always, Jim. I just did a drawing workshop where I was just showing people how to draw with shapes because I think uh, when you kind of understand that, then it makes everything a little bit more kind of accessible and you think you can kind of do everything with it, um, which is great. Uh, chatted to loads of different people and was, you know, helping lots of kids. It was really fun. Um, it felt very much like I kind of just started and then it was like two hours of chaos and I finished, but uh, it was great fun. I just feel like I need to Very well managed now. chaos, I think. That's, well managed that's chaos, yes. yes. But, I mean, it's kids. It's going to be chaos. You've got to embrace the chaos, you know. Uh, it, yeah, no, it was really good fun. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We learned a lot. 
uh, the kids had a wonderful time, and it's really nice to see you know a specialist at work. Oh, thank you very much. No, so I, thank you for I, having I us. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. So now it is time for I think one of the most important bits of what we do on the Dadler Soul sessions. It's time for Alex to come in and give his conflict management clinic. Alex, hello. How are you doing? Hello, Jim. I'm very well indeed. Thank you. How are you? I'm I'm really good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm waiting to hear your pearls of wisdom um, because it, it brightens up my month. It's always, you know, you mentioned communication a lot, and I think it's always worth repeating. Communication is the key to a lot of issues, right? It is indeed. Yes. I mean, I couldn't do my job in a GP surgery unless I communicated. It's It's the biggest single part of my job, whether that is writing, email, on the phone, video calls, or face-to-face, old-fashioned. You know, it's always about communicating. Well, we will see how many times you mention communication in these three questions we've had in. Uh, number one, we've had a friend who's always late. We've got a friend who's always late. Some of the lads pass it off as something that we just have to put up with. But I think it's rude, especially when we're going away for the weekend and we spend some of that precious time standing around and waiting for him. How do I let him know it's not okay? Okay. First up, see if there's a reason that he's always late um it there could be a reason um it's there are probably too many to try and list any here but he could be somebody who is just not able to properly plan through um the times that he needs to get organized for example you say right we'll meet you down the pub at eight o'clock yeah so he lives 20 minutes away from the pub if he walks. He's going to walk because he wants to have a drink. But he thinks, right, I, I've got to get there. I've got to be there for eight. So about a quarter to eight, he thinks, oh, I better go. But he's got to get ready. And then he ends up turning up late because he took five minutes to get ready because he has ha- hair like mine, so it doesn't, doesn't take that long. And he then walks for 20 minutes, turns up 15 minutes late. So actually, some people are just genuinely bad at planning. And actually say to him, you know, right, we're going to meet you at the pub. You're going to walk. Yeah, right. It takes you 20 minutes to walk, five minutes to get yourself ready. So let's say half seven, you start getting sorted. Is that all right? Yeah, that could help. Um, Of course, there's there's the classic of we're going to meet at the pub at eight. So you tell him we'll meet at a quarter to eight. (laughs) And you just allow. Yeah. Um, I permanently have my daughter's clock in her bedroom five minutes fast. Of course. She still turns up late and nearly <laughs> and misses the bus to college, but we are getting better. So often when somebody is perpetually late, it's simply because they just aren't good at planning. And it can sometimes be helpful to plan. But you do have to say to them, look, it's upsetting. It's it, it, it frustrates us. Don't use the I'm annoyed word, you know, just say it's just frustrating. And, it, and it's sad because you want to spend time together. You want to have a laugh but it's not doing, it's it's not happening. And it's the start of the evening is spoiled. Yeah, I can, I can get that because especially, you know, when you're all parents, you don't have that much time for socializing. And if yeah. some of that time is spent going, oh, where's Barry? It's really, it is quite annoying. Although yeah. we don't say the annoyed word, right? No, we it, avoid that because it can be a little bit confrontational. Yeah, I get, I get that. I understand that. Okay, so it's just a... It's sort of helping him along, jimmy yeah. him along a little bit. Yeah. Um, and just see if there's some underlying reason. You know, is he waiting for a babysitter? Is he, you know, I don't know if this person's with or not with the the mother of their children, but if he's waiting for the mum to turn up to take the children, is she always late? And he doesn't want to admit that it, she's always late or whatever. I don't know. Okay, But there's often a reason. It goes back to that same thing that I've said. There's a reason behind it somewhere, and you have to explore to find that. Okay. Uh, Next question. My wife doesn't listen to me. uh, There's so much stuff that I tell her that she then forgets or she hasn't taken in in the first place. How can I ensure she actually listens to what I have to say? Listening and hearing are two different things, first up. Listen is and particularly active listening is where you totally focus on what the person is saying and you don't actually think about how you're going to answer Um, because if you do 50 percent of your brain is processing what you're going to say therefore you've just lost half your brain power on listening to them 
But assuming she is focused on you, then there's probably another cause. Some people's brain wiring or the wiring of their brain, for want of a better phrase, is different. And they just don't take in new information as rapidly as other people do. Um, particularly if there's a series of facts or a series of instructions. They struggle by about 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And so if you are going to say, oh, I met Jim today. He had a haircut. He'd been to the opticians. He's thinking about buying a new car. You've thrown in three facts there, four facts, even if you include the fact you met Jim. And some people will just not be able to process those four facts. Other people are brilliant. They'll remember the most minute detail from 20 years ago. And it's not the fact that they're clever and other people aren't clever. It's just the fact that our brains are wired differently. So assuming there's not some emotional reason why she doesn't want to listen to you, which is always a possible, um, I think it's very much like that there's probably an underlying cause um, and explore why. You know, you don't want to start getting patronizing and saying, look, I'll write it all down for you. But something that would be interesting is to chat to um, your wife in this case and say, you know, and sort of bring up what was it like at school? Because often if people do have a different brain wiring, which these days we're good at picking up, 20, 30 years ago, we weren't. And she might have said, well, actually, oh, we struggled in class. Mm. And that might give you the clue. But I've gone down the line here that there's a possible underlying cause. Of course, there could be. She simply doesn't want to listen to you. <laughs> <laughs> there's always that. Oh, this person's really boring. Oh, well, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> there's, 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 there's always that. But as I say, you know, if it's something important, then, you know, when you do the shopping, you do a list. Well, you know. I can tell you my wife writes down lists for me of things to do and I'm quite happy because I will forget but that's usually because my brain is so full of other things that's <laughs> why it's literally run out of space yeah I hate that feeling that feeling when you're like I have to remember this I have to remember this and someone adds some more information you're like, that is not fair you're overloading me now it's literally you are like a cup full of water yeah and you've just put some more water in which means some of the original water due to Archimedes' principle, has fallen out. Oh, it's so true. And those people who remember things for ages and ages, they're children, right, mainly? They're children who remember when you've said that they can have something sweet and yep. then they're hoping they've forgotten, and they have not forgotten. Yep, no, exactly, yes. I have a funny story about that with my own children that I might share another time. <laughs> uh, in this, For this principle, if it is genuinely the uh, the wife in question she just, just struggles to keep so much information would it be something that the person who's written in wrote in here um who's written in here rather um i've got an english literature degree well there you go um would it be something for them to maybe think about how they deliver information so maybe uh drip feed information give small amounts of information at a time yeah supply it in small bite-sized chunks um with a with a confirmation of understanding after each one but you've got to be so careful because that could end up appearing very condescending <laughs> it's about how you it's about how you do it it's not what you do it's about how you do it right, okay um i it, it's something i sometimes do if i if i'm giving my patients a series of instructions particularly if it's in relation to a medicine um and it's quite complicated and we only have a certain amount of space to be able to write instructions on a prescription and if it's more complicated than that or it involves two or three medicines and the way that you take them together or not together as the case may be or what order to take them in then i give it in small chunks and confirm understanding but to be honest i usually well i used to write it down these days i don't i type it and text it to them uh, because it's quicker and easier yeah because when the doctor says you know take it this this is this i always just nod and smile and thinking it'll be written down when i get it i'm sure yeah no it, it will be it's, it's usually when we've got some complex skin problem and there's like three different creams and they have to take them at certain put them on at certain times certain orders gaps between each one <laughs> that's when it gets complicated that does seem complicated yes um so the next one is my boss loves me which is great for me i mean you know 
couldn't say the same about me with Dan from Dadless Soul, but whatever. Um, but my colleagues are starting to notice that I get all the best tasks. He always praises me in meetings, even when he criticizes other team members. Obviously, I want to keep him on side, but I also don't want my college colleagues to hate me. It's making the office a toxic environment, to be honest. How can I deal with this? Okay. Um, the, the first thing that came into my mind was push back mm. along the lines of, I'd love to do that, but I'm going to struggle for time at the moment because of X, Y, Z, even if you're not struggling for time. Yeah. Mm. Make it as so you are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you could also say, however, rather than just presenting your boss with the problem, I'm not going to do it because I haven't got time, is why don't you ask so-and-so to do it? They'd be really good at it. Mm. Yeah. So actually push forward other members of the, of the team. Um, or you can try and get other members of the team to volunteer and say, look, I think I'm going to get asked this. You know, If you think a task is coming your way before it gets to you, say, you know, I think the boss is going to want me to do this. I really haven't time. Would you be able to do it for me? Yeah. Um, or that's a really nice, or actually be honest, that's a really nice task. That's, that's a good one to do. Look, I've done a lot of them. It's more than, more than fair for you to have your turn. Why don't you volunteer for it? Yeah. Um, but you have to be careful. You don't want to come across as being work shy to your mates <laughs> or to your work colleagues. Otherwise, they're going to go from hating you for getting all the nice jobs to hating you for offloading everything on them. <laughs> um, but likewise, volunteer to take the not so nice tasks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, but relationships between bosses and their staff is always very, very complicated. And, you know, people say, oh, he's, you know, the equivalent of teacher's pet. Yeah, or she's the teacher's pet or whatever, or the boss's favourite. Speaking of somebody who is a boss, I, I have a team that report to me. Um, it's very easy to have a favourite. Yeah, very easy. Um, because that's human nature. You like some people more than you like others. And although I recruited a large number of my team, so it's my, it's my fault for having them because I've recruited them. <laughs> um, you still, over time, develop a likeness for one more than the other. That's human nature. There's nothing wrong with that. But the boss, and to be a good boss, and I'm not saying that I am necessarily, but a good boss has to be able to step away from that emotion and see it and see it for what it is and realize that they have to strike a line down the middle. Now, this person can't start telling their boss that. So what they do is they, as I say, start trying to encourage other people to volunteer. They they themselves will volunteer for the less glamorous tasks and just try and share the workload out. Mm. Okay. Take the initiative, almost take the initiative away from the boss and you decide who does what, but don't come across in that way. So you're not running with the ball. You're not knocking it back to the boss. You're sort of deflecting it it's coming to you and you're deflecting it onto someone else yes doing a nice dummy and pretending to kick kick the ball and let it go straight past you to the player behind right this is the this is the analogy we needed <laughs> this is good which is um, not bad for somebody who i'll uh, be honest does not like football i'm a rugby <laughs> and a cricket man well there you go i'm impressed i'm impressed um i don't like football i support scumthorpe united that's barely football um <laughs> This is a football gag for all the football people there listening. Um, okay, thank you. That's great. Uh, that's I mean, imagine being in the position where your boss really liked you. We'll see. Brilliant. I, I was a boss for a short amount of time. Absolutely hated it. I hated it because of that reason. Because you didn't. I didn't want to show any favoritism, and I didn't want to get you know kind of involved in those politics. And I didn't like criticizing people. And I just did all the work myself because I was like, oh no. Like, I can't give that to them. That's awful. Yeah, no, I, I have to be honest. I'm sometimes at work when I'm the one who's handing out when the patients are calling up and they're needing appointments and I'm dishing out the appointments to them and I'm looking at it going, that's going to be a really tough appointment. Who do I give it to? You know, and that's going to be a really quick, easy one. Who do I give that to? And it's about trying to be fair. So I get it. It is difficult. It is challenging. But 
you know, if you always, here it comes, communicate clearly and succinctly, then it usually works. <laughs> what a way to finish. Alex, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Just supremely helpful as ever. Thank you. No problem. Experience was it a bit daunting? Was it good to just meet up with other dads? Like, what, what did you think? I wasn't expecting anything particularly. I just thought it'd be because I knew him, it would be interesting. And actually, it's been really, really good. We've managed to talk to a lot of people, we've been able to talk about stuff you wouldn't necessarily normally be able to talk about in a pub. And that sort of thing, which isn't. So you don't normally have a conversation with say, how many children have you got? And uh, what's your what's your relationship status? And that's sort of so, yeah. um, That's not something you normally get a chance to sort of say in a pub. You know, it's, uh, just slap each other around the back. And... <laughs> yeah. Guilty as charged. So, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Good, good, good. And uh, most importantly, you're going to come back. Yes, that's the first beer. <laughs> great, great. As, as sponsored by... Um, Unbarred. Unbarred. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> right. you have a very nice day. Good. Thanks, Sean. Cheers. Uh, so this is the Dadless Soul sessions for April. Hello to Alex, who's going to be taking his boy along to their first Dadless Soul event on Saturday. Looking forward to it. Hello to Sally, to Kelly as well, to Jaden, um, to uh, Dr. JL Adolf, to Brandon, and to everyone else as well who's been listening and commenting as well. Thank you very much for doing that. Now, uh, time for our main guest of the evening. It is Susie Carlick. Am I saying Carlick? Is that right? Yes, you are. Oh, I shouldn't. I should have had faith in myself, shouldn't I? Yeah, but you know, it's it's a weird name, so it's understandable. Well, I don't, it, I, I don't know. It's, it, I just lose confidence in names. I don't know if you ever. Do, this is not relevant to what you're here to talk about at all. But I, I, even when I know someone, sometimes if there's like an Amanda, I'm like Amanda, Amanda, Amanda. Are you sure, it's not Angela. Oh God, I don't want to say it just in case. And then I get it wrong. So I should, I, I'm going to aim to have more confidence in names going forward. You know what? My, my older brother um, has the most confidence in names of anyone in the world, even though he almost never gets them correct. <laughs> he just throws stuff out and figures, well, you know, I've got a one in a million chance of being right. Maybe I'll be right. But if not, it's entertaining. Yeah, there you go. It is entertaining. It is, you might as well give it a go. I, I envy those people who can go into a room going, I'm going to call you Darren, and it doesn't matter if that's not your name. Oh, wow. Well. Everyone's a Darren eventually, yeah. Exactly. Now, Susie, you are here because um, you do something very special. So you're part of, uh, part of, you are the brains behind Pretty Deadly Self-Defense, which is, well, I mean, I don't know why. I'm, I'm going to try and explain that to you. You try and explain it to us. That seems the better way of doing it, doesn't it? Thanks. Yes, I'm the founder of Pretty Deadly Self-Defense, the brains and the brawn, actually. That's probably the only time I'm ever going to be able to make that claim. <laughs> Pretty Deadly is a women's self-defense program. I mean, it's primarily for women at the moment, but it's actually open to everyone of all genders. Um, it's a self-defense program that I developed based on my experience as a violent crime survivor and then my subsequent many years of martial arts training. The approach that we take in Pretty Deadly is a little bit different than what you normally think of when you think of self-defense. Usually self-defense kind of comes at things, and, and I totally get this as a martial artist, but a lot of self-defense trainers come at things like, okay, let's go, and you know they're really, really gung-ho and really aggressive, but that's very difficult for women to learn in that fashion. There's so many other things going on um, for women in a self-defense class and having an instructor who's a black belt and has probably just shown you how badass he is also be like, ah, ah, super aggressive. It's, it just makes it impossible. So I created Pretty Deadly um, because I want more women to feel comfortable learning about their bodies in this way. Because that's all it really is, is body literacy over body, bodily harm is what we usually say. Um, and yeah, it's uh, focused on natural movements, things that we do every day in our daily lives. So we do have a, an all men's program and we adapt the movements a little bit between men and women because some things are gender specific. Um, 
but it's taking those movements you do every day and then reapplying them to self-defense situations so that you don't have to worry about, am I going to remember this? Do I need to train the muscle memory? Do I have to train for 20 years? Um, it, it, how do I know this is even going to come up when I need it? It's already there inside of you and we're just helping you make a new connection with it. So it's, it becomes kind of intuitive. For people. Yeah, it's really intuitive. And uh, I mean, you talked about that. Do you, I mean, you trained and you trained hard and for a long time, right? And it, was that your experience was that the instructors or many of the instructors you came across were that kind of character? And, and you know, did, did that mean it, it took longer to get where you wanted to go? Oh, that depends on moods. So my, my sensei um, is... A, I've known him for such a long time. So, and everybody's human. So you go through periods where life is great and you're light and you're happy. And in the dojo, those training periods were really fun and full of laughter. And we were really encouraged to play. We were always encouraged to play. But, you know, again, life is life. And if he was going through a more difficult time or just in a really bad mood or whatever it was, then sometimes those trainings were very much like very aggressive, very militant, um, but always with some play. That is one of the gifts that he gave me and I think gave everyone that has ever trained with him. But there are, there are people who, and women as well, not just men, but there are people who are just super militant about it. Um, and there are people who are just really, really light and happy. And then you've got everything in between. So it kind of depends. But I think when people are thinking about self-defense um, and creating a self-defense class or offering a self-defense class, they get themselves really worked up because it's important. You know, the idea of like, I want you to be able to defend yourself. I want you to be able to protect yourself. And then we kind of, I think people just get themselves really keyed up. Like, you got to know how to do this because this might happen to you. And I really want you to get it. And I want you to get it now. But that's a lot of pressure. And on top of the pressure of just being there in the first place. So that's one of the things we're trying to counter with Pretty Deadly. And, and how do you do that? How do you make that kind of, because I, I noticed you talked about um, in something I read that you'd written about martial arts not being necessarily just a, a, a kind of a sport or an action. It's like a lifestyle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, how do you kind of get people into that frame of mind to, to make these sort of things into their lifestyle rather than, oh, now I've got to switch on self-defense mode? Um. Well, I'd like to separate martial arts from self-defense because they're two different things. I mean, at the end of the day, there are martial artists who compete. They support their families and their, themselves as professional athletes, basically. Um, but at the end of the day, martial arts is a hobby. Mm -hmm. Self-defense, which Dura is, you know, the foundation is often in martial arts. But self-defense is something completely different. It's not competition. It's not a fight. Um, it's really about defending yourself. So getting into a martial arts mindset or, or making incorporating a martial arts spirit into your daily life isn't so necessary because that's kind of one path. But what I've tried to do with Pretty Deadly is take some of the, take some of the essences of martial arts that I felt were really, really important to me as a woman and boil them down into more bite-sized chunks so that we can help help people incorporate that into their lives. So by doing that, the first thing that we really work on is helping people learn how to trust their bodies. And by that, I don't necessarily mean, um, I don't necessarily mean in a, in a, that kind of like overly self-care kind of way. And I mean that in the way that um, the wellness industry for a little while got kind of toxic in the whole self-care thing. But more in the sense of if we really look at the way that our bodies are taking care of us, it's pretty amazing. And it, they, our bodies do take care of us in ways that are automatic. And we never really stop to appreciate it because, I mean, why would we? You know, there's nobody to tell us to do that. There's no real reason to do that. But to me, that's the key is learning how to trust yourself and once you know that you can trust yourself, then it's a lot easier to 
try new things, but also remember that you do have these things in you. Um, I, I don't, you, you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. Um, I, th I thought it might be interesting to sort of know your story and your background, but I understand obviously that can be quite traumatic. So if you don't want to do that, that's absolutely fine. But it sort of does lead into why you, why you were uh, kind of founded pretty deadly, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, why do what I do? It's um, it's not a problem. I speak about it openly. I've written about it. You can find my story online. Um, and I do want to say that it is no... So what happened to me happened tw 23 years ago. I forget if we're in 2023 or 2024. Um, and it's no longer traumatic. Right. And that's a really interesting thing because that just happened that sort of reaching the end of trauma. And that, that's that been a really big part of my life recently. So I wanna make that clear that trauma isn't necessarily forever. And that's a very important thing for people to know because I don't think we know that. Um, what happened to me, the very, very short version, you may have noticed that I have trouble answering questions in any kind of succinct way. Oh, that's um, really fine for the purposes of this. That yeah. is brilliant. <laughs> Um, what happened to me was I was living in Los Angeles. It was the year 2000. Um, a man broke into my house in the middle of the night and tried to kill me. That's the very, very short version. There's a little bit more to it than that. He had kind of like, we could say, cased the joint. Um, I think he was loitering because some of my neighbors had warned me the night before that there was what we all thought was a peeping Tom, but I'm pretty sure was actually the guy. Um, nobody knew him, nobody saw him, nobody knew who he was. Um, but I think he was, he was trying to find the, the, the easiest target. And that happened to me, be me because of the apartment I was living in, because I was very alone in the sense of, I was still pretty new to town, so I didn't have a lot of friends coming and going. Um, so it would have been a lot easier to kind of make me disappear and, not have too many people look for me and not have people discover it for a bit. The, the event itself was in the middle of the night. As I said, it was um, at 4.17 in the morning because I remember looking at the clock. Um, and it maybe lasted like, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes. I don't really know myself because I was in it and I was in shock. Um, and then it was over and, and that was that. And the guy literally ran out the front door um, and, and, and took off and that was it. And as far as I know, he's never been caught. Although I have put in a request to the LAPD uh, earlier this year asking for my police report. So we'll see if he was ever caught or not. Oh, wow. And so that is, I mean, something that will obviously at, at the time, while that's fresh, that's something that, you know, you can go back to, you can't go back to a normal life for a while, surely, because you're always thinking in the back of your mind, even if they'd caught this person, I imagine in the back of your mind, there's always, well, is there someone else as well? Yeah. Um, yeah. You can never go back to a regular life. Your life as you knew it is finished. And I think this is one of the things that makes things so difficult for everyone who experiences trauma is a lot of the, the, the aspects of trauma that, that kind of continues or prolongs trauma for a long time and makes our lives very difficult when we've experienced so, a, a big traumatic event is that we're always trying to go back to that moment just before not necessarily 10 years before or six months before, it's just before your entire life changed. That's what you want to get back to more than anything else. But you can't. Your life is completely changed. And it takes a while to accept that and grow into it. And it certainly did for me too. Um, the way that trauma showed up for me over a long period of time was in the way that it shows up for a lot of women. And I think for men too who experience violence, there's a lot of shooting yourself in the foot. Any new opportunity that seems really great, you manage to sabotage. Um, there's, of course, a lot of depression. There's a lot of paranoia, um, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. Um, 
there's difficulty connecting to other people. There's difficulty managing anger and rage. Um, it's just, it's hard until you sort of figure out and get to the point where you accept that, okay, I'm, I'm just not going to go, I, I can't go back to that place. It's just not there for me anymore. I can only go forward. So it's, it's complicated. But yeah, that's what pushed me into this because my first thought after, um, I don't know, a day or two after it happened was, I never want this to happen again, of course, but I felt like I couldn't, um, I couldn't control my body. I didn't know any martial arts for self-defense at the time, but even if I had, um, I was just reacting. So I couldn't focus on a target. I couldn't choose any cool technique. I couldn't decide what my body did or didn't do. I had zero control. So I felt if that ever happens again, I want to train my body so that every move it makes naturally is as devastating as possible. Because if it ever happens again, I am not going to be the only one hurt in this situation. And that's how I found martial arts, because to me, that was going straight to martial arts and bypassing any kind of self-defense myself, which is telling you something about the state of self-defense. <laughs> It's it's interesting, isn't it? Because you, for people who've never been through that, you often see, and I mean, this is maybe toxic social media culture, but people going, "Well, I'd have done this. Well, why didn't you do this?" Oh, yes. that happen? And until you've been in that situation, I mean, I, I I'm guessing because I don't know. I thankfully never been in that situation, but I can imagine you're not sit, you're not taking a second to go hang on if i do this then this will you know it, it has to be it just happens right yeah it, yeah it really just happens so in a really threatening situation your amygdala activates the most primitive part of your brain and that's your fight flight or freeze center basically that also is activating it has a really interesting relationship with memory um and that's an important thing to know because what your brain is doing is kind of pulling up every single memory you've ever had, not all at once, but kind of pulling up every single memory you've ever had to see, is this a tool that I can use right now? Um, we all have a self-defense system and that self-defense system, if you've never trained martial arts or you've never taken a self-defense class, you still have a self-defense system. And that is not only kind of the way that you respond to things naturally, it's not only some of your biology. So for example, if you smell rotten food in the fridge, food doesn't really have a positive or negative smell, but for us, it might smell rotten because that's our self-defense system saying, don't eat this. As you know, you can also override that from time to time <laughs> and make stupid decisions because we're human and we do stuff like that. But if I were a seagull and I smelled that food, that might smell great to me. So, but it's our self-defense system that says, no, this is poisonous. Part of our self-defense system is also information that we've taken in over the course of our lives. Literally everything we've ever taken in. So watching action movies, listening to true crime podcasts, um, playing, you know, play fighting with friends, all of that stuff are also ways that we learn to defend ourselves. I think that these are really great things, but I think when, when women are thinking of self-defense, we're often thinking it's something we have to learn, something extraneous to our life experience, as opposed to something that's actually already incorporated or that we may be incorporating. Like really, if you, most true crime podcast listeners are women. And although we think it's because we love all the salacious details and, or we like to solve crimes or whatever it is, um, what we're really doing is learning how to defend ourselves in those situations because most of the victims in those true crime podcasts are women. This is, is obviously fascinating. And, you know, we're a very male focused, uh, organization and this, it is helpful. I think for dads, uh, the dads that are listening to understand that kind of frame of mind, because that's not something that we have to deal with particularly not i mean i can't speak for everyone of course but in general that's not 
how we focus on those situations, it, it, it's really interesting to hear that that has to be the mindset because I imagine for women, there is more of a chance of being the victim, isn't there? It's, um, I prefer to use the word target. A lot of people really feel uncomfortable with victim because it, it implies helplessness. Um, so target seems to be a bit more easy to swallow. Excuse me. <clears throat> I was swallowing a bunch of tea, so now I'm burping. Um, yeah, the mindset is is really, really different in the sense of, you know, we, what I always say in my courses to all the women that are gathered there of all different shapes and sizes and backgrounds and ages is every single woman knows how to make herself very small, very fast. And every woman in the room, regardless of her size or age or background, will nod and go, yep, I know exactly how to do that. And when I've said that to a room full of men, men are like, mm, no, <laughs> I'm not really sure what you mean by that. So it, it, we start learning from a really young age that we're in danger. There is so much in society that tells us that, regardless of how protective you are of your children, um, of how safe you try to keep them. And, and whether that's safety by keeping them, uh, kind of keeping them, I don't want to use the word isolated, but sort of keeping them wrapped in, in, in your care, or it's safety by providing them knowledge. Either way, it's you can't keep your daughters that safe, unfortunately. There is just so much in society that tells us all the time you are in danger. So we start learning as very little girls how to protect ourselves, even though we're not very conscious of it. Almost every little girl has had some creepy adult man stare at her in a really penetrating way. And I don't mean 12-year-old girls. I mean five-year-old girls, four-year-old girls, girls who are too young to be able to articulate these things. And I know if you're listening and you have children, regardless of gender, and this information is really upsetting you, I apologize, but it's true. And if you ask your children, especially your children who identify as girls, they will confirm that. It's um, it, every girl, this is something else that I learned from the same, my, my name Cavalier brother, um, who has two daughters. Every girl is afraid that someone will come in in the middle of the night and try to kill them. Every woman is afraid of that as well. And you can ask your partners and you can ask your daughters if your daughters haven't already gone through that phase of talking to you, that phase, sorry, of talking to you about it. Every single female human on this planet has that fear, on the planet. And I say this because I work with women all over the world, if from Uganda to Pakistan to Nepal to Japan to wherever, we all have this fear. And men never have this fear. So it's, it's the, the differences of what we're told as we're growing up are so vast. And a lot of that has to do with, with what we get to learn and what we get exposed to. It may be that little boys um, are also afraid of someone breaking in in the middle of the night, but little boys are also more exposed to TV shows and movies and play fighting and the kinds of things where they start to learn, hey, I can kind of take care of myself. Or I can imagine what it would be like because I'm watching, I doubt that any of you are allowing your small children to watch John Wick movies, but <clears throat> nonetheless, I've been watching these kinds of movies, whether it's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which again is more appealing to boys than girls, or John Wick. And, and of course, everything in between. Boys are learning these things and girls are not. Maybe that's what helps boys stay safe who grow up into men who, who are having a different experience. This I'm not really sure of, but I do know that we also get a lot of outside signals that tell us you're, you're never safe. So, so how can we... Um, 
go about creating a different environment, changing that? How can we go about changing that? What can we do either within our households or even in the wider world? I think within your households, a good thing to do with, with your kids, especially if they're showing signs of, of this kind of fear, of a fear that you can't see, is to actually walk them through a plan. Let them know that you take them seriously. Even if you, even if like you just can't, like it's driving you crazy. Why do you not, why can I not make you feel safe? I think is sometimes a frustration parents have. But just take what they're saying that they don't feel safe and then walk them through the steps. Okay, so if this were to happen, what can we do? Let's walk through it. Let's map it out in the same way that you might map out a fire escape route. Map out a safety route. Map out plans. That really, really helps. When you feel completely helpless because you don't know what to do, that's what kind of amps the fear and the anxiety. The fear that kids feel or the fear that kids experience, especially girls who are experiencing that sexualized danger, um, it's really important to take that seriously and to pay really a close, really close attention to your kids. I see this all the time here in Berlin, and I know it's never intentional from dads. Um, but I see, for example, somebody on the on the subway, a father and daughter, and the daughter is sitting on the, the there's two seats or one seat available, and it's next to some old man. And the father wants his daughter to sit down so that she's not moving around with the train. She sits next to the old man. He starts smiling at her. And the father strikes up a conversation, not recognizing the discomfort of his daughter. Mm -hmm. The father is, so now the daughter can feel quite betrayed. You know, and what, not, um, betrayed isn't really the right word because on the one hand, she'll know, like, I know you don't mean to do this, but on the other hand, can you not see how creepy this guy is? But I'm also too young to articulate any of this. So pay attention to your daughter's body language, pay attention to the way she's holding herself, especially around old men, because, well, and young men who are creepy too, because what these kinds of people are doing is they're, they know they're getting away with it. They know that the dad that they're talking to isn't seeing what this little girl is experiencing. They know that they're playing a double game and they're having a really good time with it. So look at your daughter. Don't look at the friendly guy sitting next to your daughter. Don't encourage her to smile back at him. And if she's suddenly sh a lot shyer than she normally is, that's a really big signal that there's a problem. And she, it, you would be doing her a big favor to move her away. I think another thing that we can do is also help teach our kids, regardless of gender, how bodies work. Not only, you know, girls get to learn about our reproductive systems and we learn about our menses and we learn about um, a lot of emotions. We get names for everything. We actually have a really, really good education in emotional um, intelligence as well as reproductive health and a little bit about sexual health. I think we get a lot more than boys do. And I think that that's a problem actually, because when boys don't know how to, or any human, when we don't know how to name something, then we have a tendency to kind of just like shove it away. I don't know, I'll deal with it later. But that means that you never really learn how your own sexual drive works. You never really learn how your own sexuality works. You never really learn how your own emotions work because you can't name anything. You're, you're devoid of a vocabulary. I think we need more of a balance. Whereas boys get lots and lots of body literacy, girls can also have body literacy. Girls get lots and lots of emotional intelligence. Boys can have that too. And I think we need to be a little more conscious about you know, how we're divvying this up and instead of divvying it up, just spreading it around. I think... Um, it's also important to watch your girls when they think you're not looking. I see this again, I don't have children of my own, 
Um, but I see kids most, uh, apparently I'm on the subway a lot cause I'm telling you a bunch of subway <laughs> stories. Um, I see girls in dresses and hair done up and they're kicking things and they're punching and they're making finger guns and they're tearing around. They're having a really great time. And the minute a parent looks at them, they're perfect little girls because they're not allowed to play like that. Right. Let them play. They love to punch and kick. Trust me. I have taught girls. They love it. Um, they love getting to know this stuff. They learn in different ways. We're socialized to learn in different ways. So they might not be punching a kick pad for like, you know, 50 minutes like a boy, but they're still going to get a lot out of it. And they like to learn the way that their bodies work. I think as a whole, as a society, that's, that's what it boils down to. You know, it's, it's, I heard a little bit of the end of Alex's, um, segment where he was talking about, it's about clear communication. And I think that's true here as well. Not only clear communication between parent and child um, about threats and helping your children learn how to articulate a threat is also very important, um, but also clear communication about our bodies and our emotions across the genders or spread out among the genders. I think that that levels the playing field a little bit for all of us. And it gives girls the kind of confidence that boys have. And it gives boys the kind of sensitivity that girls have. Yeah, it, it seems strange that there still is that, that kind of divide, which hopefully is getting better and people are becoming more aware of. But you, you're absolutely right. You know, that still there is very much a kind of, yeah, emotional intelligence for... Uh, for, for girls and uh, body intelligence and, you know, in, in, you know, kind of playing and fighting and stuff for boys. It's, it's odd, but hopefully we, we can start changing that. We can start making differences. Uh, do you do, you do classes for children? Do you? Um, we occasionally do pretty deadly is mostly for adults. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but occasionally we do do classes for children we usually only work with them as a group. So we don't have like ongoing classes, but we'll do like a special workshop. Mm -hmm. And we've done classes for really young kids, like as young as four, um, all the way up to teenagers. They get different stuff because they have different concerns and different motor skills as well. Mm -hmm. um, we do do this, we, this actually, I really like this thing that we do. Um, we're partnered with an organization called CAS Trips. They work with international schools around the world to provide um, field trips for community action service that the kids usually have to do around high school age. And we're one of the partners. So they usually bring in a whole bunch of kids from somewhere exotic, like Malta or Qatar or something. We teach them how to teach self-defense. And then as a group, we go and work with a nonprofit organization so that the kids that we've taught are now passing that information on to their peers, supervised, of course. Yeah. The last group that we had were so wonderful and also very efficient. So they got through their, their sort of mini workshops really quickly. And then the kids that they were teaching, the kids in Berlin, started teaching them, right. which was great. It was one of my favorite things I've ever seen. So, yeah, we do work with kids, but we mostly focus on adults because although a lot of adult women don't feel like you may not know this, but a lot of women, once they're married, feel like they don't have to worry so much about their safety anymore because now it's it's your problem. Right. That's not really logical because you're not joined at the hip all the time, but I do think that this is another way that we're kind of socialized. Um, but because we're not joined at the hip all the time, we feel it is really important that adult women also learn how to learn how to defend themselves um, because that's the way the world is at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it would be nice if you didn't have to do what you do, but <laughs> unfortunately... Or fortunately for you, you do, I guess. It's an odd one, isn't it? That. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I've been doing this for so long now that it started as a kind of, um, I don't want anyone to be a victim. And of course, that's still very true. Um, and then a period of 
<clears throat> gender-based violence and patriarchy and, you know, smash it all, blah, blah, blah. And, and a lot of that is still true as well. I'm not a big fan of patriarchy. However, at this point, um, I look at things more in the sense of there is violence in every single species on this planet. And there is always a percentage of whatever species that's going to be more violent than others because they're on a certain spectrum of sociopathy or I don't know how you classify that for like plants, but nonetheless, in that way. I believe that women are targeted, women and girls are targeted um, simply because the people who inhabit violence are well aware of what information is withheld from us. They know that we are less likely to know how to defend ourselves. So therefore we're easier targets. Because I think people who inhabit violence are gonna do violence anyway. And it's just a matter of who are they gonna do it to. There is gender-based violence that's very specific about gender um, there is violence that's used to humiliate because of gender. I guess I'm trying to talk about rape without saying the word rape, but I, that's kind of silly. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, violence is violence. It exists. It's going to exist with us. It's always existed with us. It's always going to exist with us. But the fact that only half of us know how to defend ourselves or feel like we would be able to defend ourselves is where I see the problem. And so at this point, it's really just getting the other half up to speed. The people in habit violence, they're gonna find another target. It's, it, they're, they're always gonna have a target. But <clears throat> I feel that women, um, you know, it's been 2000 years or so that we've been the targets. <laughs> and I feel like, you yeah, that focus could shift. We could use a break. But it's really not up to us whether the focus shifts, but what is up to us is to know how to use our bodies and know how to rely on ourselves. I feel that um, I say this a lot when I'm giving talks about Pretty Deadly in general, is that you know, women spend about 50% of our time strategizing how to stay safe. I don't know if men are really aware of that, that there, this is like a program that's always running in the background of our own safety. But that means that that's 50% of our time and energy that's, that's focused only on that and not being invested in our families, in our careers, in our educations, in our communities. One of the, the things we really want to do with Pretty Deadly, our big vision mission, is to free up that 50% so that women can wholly contribute to their families and their communities and to the world in general. I think there's a job for all of us, isn't there, really? And I think to make uh, the streets less intimidating, there are things that we can do there. I mean, not walk behind a lone single woman late at night, uh, you know, maybe cross the road or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, so there are all sorts of things. So I guess that that feeds into it as well. And then obviously what you're doing is... Um, is, is giving women that confidence that if anything did happen, they know how to use their bodies to give themselves a chance, I guess. Well, I would say if anything did happen, you know you're going to do something. But I, I don't believe that we can prevent violence. I would just went off about that. Um, but I do believe that we can mitigate the effects of long-term trauma. And when we feel that we have taken action and had autonomy in disrupting violence as it happens, that's what lowers the risk of long-term trauma. That's what lowers the risk of you not being able to go back to those seconds before that thing happened. Right. So that's what we're, that's, that's my particular approach about self-defense. Okay. And if we uh, have people in our lives that, um, would like to find out more, what, what can we find? Where can we find out the information? So you can visit us at prettydeadlyselfdefense.com. What we do now actually is certify fitness professionals and martial artists to teach our program. Um, it's a 
pretty rigorous certification. We're, cert we're accredited by SimSpa in the UK. So we have four trainers right now in the UK. Um, let's see if I can remember where everybody is. <laughs> uh, we have Bill Little at Hanryu Dojo in uh, Farnham in Surrey. Uh, I know he's, he's got some courses listed on his site for September. Uh, we have Jennifer Moray, who I can't remember where she is, but I know she's going to launch some courses, I think, in later this month or in June. Oh, she's online right now. I see her. Well, where are you, Jennifer? Can you type that in the chat? <laughs> um, we have Katarina Tarman, who is in Whitechapel, and Karis McRae, who is in London. I don't think either one of them are launching courses at the moment, but we list them all on our website so you can book directly with the trainers. Um, it's a six-week course, one hour a week. Um, it, ah, hi, Wycombe is where Jennifer is. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and yeah, that's where. If you happen to be calling in from anywhere else, we also have courses in the U.S., here in Germany and in Pakistan. So a, a worldwide operation. Um, yes. And and going from strength to strength, it seems. That's what we're that's what we're going for. Yes. Susie, it's been uh, fascinating to talk to you, Susie. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, and have you got any other messages you'd like to uh, to leave us with? Any more pearls of wisdom that uh, that we can take away from this chat? Um, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed being here and speaking with you. And, you know, I wanted to share something. As I said, I heard the, the tail end of Alex's segment, and he was talking about um, answering a question from someone who said, my boss really likes me, and I don't want to make the other, my, my colleagues jealous. And Alex was saying, you know, sometimes you have to step away from that emotion when you favor someone on your team over others. And I was thinking that's so interesting because when I teach martial arts, um, the same thing happens. You end up just like really liking one of your students and you, you can accidentally kind of give them really, really great training and everyone else sort of suffers from it. <laughs> <laughs> because you're having a really great time with that person. It's usually accidental. Um, and it's something you really have to be careful for because everyone is there equally. Everyone's paid the same amount. Everyone is there to learn the same stuff. Um, and it's just not fair to focus on one person. What that kind of sparked for me, and this is the pearl of wisdom that I will leave you with, is if knowledge is the source of power, then withholding knowledge is an abuse of power. That's kind of a, a bit of a strange bridge, but, but to me, it's kind of the same when you're learning martial arts. So I think um, for me, that's just a great thing to keep in mind, especially when I'm teaching um, and especially when we're talking about giving access to martial arts uh, or rather self-defense to, to anyone who actually really wants to learn it. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. And um yeah, based on what we've been talking about as well, it just seems like this is something that if ever, if we could get access to as many people as possible, and I know that is your mission, isn't it? That's your mission is to to get to access to for self defense for people who might not be able to get it otherwise. Then yes. hopefully, you know, we can you can you can do some real good with it. Um, Susie, thank you so much. It's been fascinating to talk to you. Thank you. I've really enjoyed being here. Uh, that is the Dadless Soul Sessions for another month. We're back on the last Thursday of May. I'm not sure who the main guest is going to be yet. I'm close to booking one or two people, so we'll find out then. Stick around. We'll put all the information onto the Dadless Soul socials as well. But thank you very much, and make sure you follow us and like us and tell your friends about us as well.